everyone, I'm Kevin O'Brien, and uh, I'm going to teach you about passwords. Uh, obviously, there's been a lot of stuff in the news about people's data being stolen, hacked, what have you, identity theft, all sorts of things. Uh, and a lot of that hinges on passwords. Uh, now, passwords are basically the key, and they're a really awful key. <laughs> and we're going to discuss why they're awful. It's a dollar store you go in and uh -huh. have it there. Yeah. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about this uh, from two different perspectives. First of all, I'm going to tell you what happens to your password when you log into a website. Because if, if you understand what they're doing, that is going to give you some insight into this process. And then talk about the things that you should be doing once you understand that. So it's kind of two parts to this. Uh, so what I want to do is start by just saying that um, you know your password, you log into a site, maybe it is Amazon or it's Google or Yahoo or what have you. Uh, maybe it's a bank, a store. You log in with a password, and that password is being stored on a server there. Um, and the, the question that you should have right away is, well, how securely are they handling the password? And the sad fact is there's a great deal of variability there. Um, and it may depend a little bit on the nature of the site. Uh, you know, certain things like with uh, health information, there are at least regulations about the things that they're supposed to do. I, mean, I don't know if you've ever heard of things like HIPAA, which is a, a government law that governs uh, uh, health information. Uh, so, uh, when you talk about security, security professionals uh, have a certain way of looking at things, and the starting point is to say, what is the asset that you're trying to protect? Because you want to be clear about that. So the, the asset you're trying to protect is access to something. That's what a password does. It grants or does not grant access. Um, so if you have the password, it's the key that unlocks the door. Uh, obviously, in many cases, this is information you do not want other people to have. It, it could be your bank account, could be your health record, could be your email, might have personal information in it, you know, all sorts of things. But some resources are more important than others, so that's also something that we want to bear in mind. Now, the thing about password security is that how passwords are handled on a website is out of your control entirely. All, all you can do is try and monitor to some degree, is this site following good practices? Um, and recently, for instance, Sony, I don't know if you heard about the, the Sony hack, uh, that a bunch of hackers went in and basically took terabytes of data out of the Sony network. Um, and a, a lot of accounts were hacked. And, and passwords and all of that. So obviously Sony did not do a very good job of this. And uh, they are rightfully being raked over the coals because of that. But we also have to recognize something, which is that you are the biggest threat to your own security. So one of the things that uh, there's a, a profession called pen testing, which is short for penetration testing. So a company that has data that they want to secure will hire a professional company to basically be what we call white hat hackers, you know, see if you can get this data. And there are various ways they do this, but one of the most common is what's called social engineering. And, and the way social engineering works I, I call you up on the phone, hi, uh, I'm with IT and uh, we've got a problem here, I need to check your password, could you tell me what it is? About 50% of people will give them the password on that phone call. Right? Uh, 
another similar way. You send an email out and you put a, a, a link in it. Um, you know, we, we need to validate your information. There's been some suspicious activity, so we need you to log in here and uh, make sure the information is correct. And what you may not realize is that you're not logging into the site you think you're logging into. It's some hacker site where you want to get your information. So these are all things that you need to be careful about. On the other hand, um, this is what's called retail. If you want to get one person's information, that's a way that you can do it. Hackers prefer to work wholesale. So if they're doing that kind of social engineering, it would be because you were a person who would provide access to even more information. Like you're an executive at a company. It's like, ah, we, we get into your account, now we're on the company network, and who knows what we're going to do. So, generally speaking, this, uh, this kind of social engineering thing is not the thing that you have to be most concerned about, but still do pay attention. If you get an email that tells you to click on a link, for instance, uh, you get something that says, uh, we've noticed suspicious activity with your credit card. Please log in here so we can validate your, you know. And it may look very authentic, and in fact, they do a good job. They have a way of grabbing the images off of the authentic website so it looks just like a bank. Um, but if you click and log in, you've just given some hacker your login credentials to your bank account. And if you do that, don't be surprised if you don't have any money within about a day. <laughs> because that's what they're looking for. So if you get one of those and, and it somehow looks vaguely plausible, like maybe this is true, forget the email, pick up the phone, call the bank. Go down to your branch office and say, hey, you know, I got this email, is this legitimate? And if there's a legitimate problem, they will be happy to help you with it. But whatever you do, don't click on the link in the email. Uh, another thing you can do is you could use a Google or, or Yahoo or whatever search engine you like and say, what is the website of this bank? And then go there without going through the link in the email. Just put that website into your browser and go there. And then, you, you know, if you get that website address from Google, that, that's going to be okay. Um, now, basically, this is all about money now. Right? This is not uh, 10, 15 years ago, you know, people were doing hacking for fun. You know, they could uh, post something up on a website, ha ha, we hacked you neener, 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 all right? No, no one bothers with that stuff anymore. This is all about serious crime. It's all about getting money. And they can get money in various ways. Uh, it, directly, they could get, you know, your bank account information. Uh, they can just suck all the money out of your account. They can get money in other ways. If they can come up with uh, a list of credit card numbers, with associated names and social security numbers, and they can get a few million of those, they can sell those on the black market for a very tidy sum to companies that might want to use that to do identity theft or, or you know, other sorts of criminal activity. So that's really what this is about. Right now, we have a problem. Uh, and the problem is called moral hazard, which is that companies are, and this is starting to change, but companies have been largely escaping liability. So they get hacked and then they put out a press release, oh, this was a very sophisticated hacker activity. No one could have predicted. Uh, but, you know, the government's not fining them for doing this. No one is facing jail time. Uh, so. What we have seen is that a lot of companies will only spend money on security 
if that is less than what it costs them if they get hacked. So in some sense, what we should be doing is raising the cost of being hacked. And that's starting to happen, um, you know, because people are starting to sue companies and say, you know, you really should have done a better job of this. Now, a big problem we have is password proliferation. Because just about any site you go to says you have to have a password, a login and a password, to do anything. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, now, the problem is a secure password is almost by definition a password that is impossible to remember. And so the, the joke about it is every password must contain a number, a letter, a symbol, a squirrel sound, and a Sanskrit hieroglyph. Well, that would be very secure, certainly. But how, how are you going to Unless you're a squirrel. Yeah, unless you're a squirrel. OK. Um, so this causes another problem. And the problem is, if you have to have a password for a hundred different sites, chances are you're not going to have a hundred different passwords. You're going to have one password that you use over and over. Now, is that a problem? And I would argue, not always. Because one of the things we have to think about is how important is the site. Now, there's a security um, expert by the name of Bruce Schneier who I follow very closely. Uh, and one of the things he starts with, he says, understand what asset you're trying to protect and then adopt measures that make sense given that asset. So one of the things you see is that a lot of sites would say, well, if you want to post a comment, you have to create a, an account and log in before you can post a comment. Is that an access that you need to protect really hard? No. Nah. You know, I have a blog. <laughs> you know, if someone wants to post a comment on my blog, and, and I might say, yeah, you got to create an account first because of spam. You know, people just posting garbage. Uh, but it's not anything important. And if I, you know, if I go to Gibbs' site and, and Gibbs' site says, oh, you got to create an account to post a comment, it's like, uh, yeah, fine, whatever. You don't care if my site gets hacked. Well, if, <laughs> if that's a route to hacking your site, that's your problem. Yeah, yeah. Because you know better. So uh, the, the, the word we use is triage. And, and that comes from medicine. But it means, you know, as, assign things a level of priority. So, um, you know, what sites are really important and which ones aren't. So. If a, if a site has an asset you really want to protect, like your banking information, your health information, your email that might have a lot of personal information, uh, have good passwords for those. You know, you really do want to have good passwords. Um, and they should have unique passwords because one of the biggest problems that we have run into is people reuse the same password. And I'm going to show you why that can get you into trouble. But, but basically, if someone cracks my password because Gibbs site has very low security, and I use the same password I use for my bank, well, they got my password there at a site that I didn't care about. But now they've also got it for a site I really do care about. And that's not a good thing. Because if they can get into my bank account, they can wire every dollar I have to an account um, in, say, Belarusia, just to pick one Eastern European place out of a hat. Uh, and the bank may say, that's not our problem. Tough. <laughs> you know. So one of the things I suggest to people Talk to your bank. Make sure you don't have things enabled that you don't need. 
Like, is, is your bank account set up to allow wire transfers? And if it is, you might want to ask yourself, have I ever done a wire transfer? So, if you're on what I call throwaway sites, no problem. I think you could probably have just one password that you use for throwaway sites. As long as the important sites are well protected. So, what we're trying to do here is, is narrow the difficulty factor. Uh, you know, a lot of people will say, Every single password you have should be 12 characters long and, and totally random, blah, 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 blah. And then it's like, well, I've got 150 passwords. How am I going to remember those? Well, I'll just write them down on a piece of paper and put it in my wallet. Yeah, that works until you lose your wallet. So, your password is stored in a database. Probably several databases. Every website that you have a password for, there's a database that stores your password. What are they doing? Well, let's take a look at this. Um, I represent a criminal syndicate. I want to get a whole bunch of passwords uh, from Oh, let's say Target. Never happened. Yeah. Because that was one that happened recently. So, there's a number of ways you could go about this, but one of them is you do a targeted attack on an individual. You know, that now in the trade that's called spear phishing. Um, and what that means is uh, I research, there's an executive there that works for this company. And I do a little bit of research about this executive, so I know something about this person. And I use that information to create an email that I can send. So maybe this person's a golf fanatic, you know. And so I'll, with something, you know, click here to see the 10 best golf courses in the United States. I'm figuring, yeah, he'll fall for that. Or, you know, I, I, find a way to adopt an identity that you know, makes it look like it's someone who knows that's sending the email. And I can spoof it. Now, another way is they can sort of get in, and this is what actually happened with Target, was they found a weakness in the point of sale system. All right? uh, and that's when, you, when you're paying, when you check out, you give them your credit card, that's a point of sale system. And that's a computerized system. It was uh, connected to the network. And they were able to find a weakness in the point of sale system and get in there and take all of that effort. So once they get in, they just take the entire database and download it. So what happens next? Well, worst case scenario, the site has simply stored the passwords as clear text. So that means once they've downloaded the database, they have everything, end of story. That's it. Um, now, how can you tell? Well, there are some signs. Um, and one of them has to do with the length of the password. If you, if you ever get an error message that says your password was too long, it needs to be no more than, say, eight characters. That's a warning sign. Um, because what that tells me is that in the database, they set aside a fixed field for passwords. And the fixed field is only eight characters long. Um, and they are not doing any kind of cryptography at all. Uh, now, even if they don't tell you, you can always test it. If you leave off the last character, and you can still get in. Because what some places will do, they'll only store the first eight characters. So even if it's a ten-character password, it's only the first eight that are stored. So, all right, I've got a ten-character password. What if I just type in the first nine? If that still lets me in, I know there's no cryptography involved. 
Now, better is using some cryptography, and that's using something called hashing. Someone really wants you. Just <laughs> shut it off. <laughs> there might be emergency. Yes. I'm, I'm busy right now. I'll call you back. No. So hashing uh, is a type of cryptography using a one-way function. Uh, and what it does is it takes whatever password you've put in and turns it into a random blob of gibberish. Uh, now that random blob tends to be a lot longer than your initial password. Usually it ends up being something like 256 characters. That's why if you enter, eight, you know, enter a 10 character password and it says, oh that's too long, I know right away there's no cryptography because with uh, with a hashed password, they'd have to be setting aside the whole 256 characters. And no matter how long your password is, the hash always winds up being the same length. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of how hashing works. It's probably going to bore everyone. But that's a good thing, what they do. So what are hashes? Um, it's a one-way process. So I can take a password, turn it into the hash. That's fine. That's easy to do. But if I have the hash, turning it back into a password is, uh, I won't say impossible, what a security expert would say, computationally infeasible. It would take a really long time. Uh, also, if the uh, nature of hashing, if you modify the original in any way, you totally change the hash. And it's not like if I change one character here, it will change one character in the hash. It's like if I change one character in a password, I get a totally different hash. And it's very unlikely that any two separate original passwords would ever generate the same hash. So I, I used infeasible, so I'll just emphasize here, with current technology, one of the things we always have to bear in mind is that things can change. But with current technology, we can do mathematics that analyze the level of resources needed to crack a hash, and we can reasonably forecast. So the National Institute of Standard, Standards and Technology says the current technology being used should be secure through the year 2030. They're working on replacements that will come online in the 2020s and, and then extend that out even further. But you want to bear in mind, it is an arms race. Uh, everyone's trying to find ways of cracking, cracking cryptography. Uh, some of them are criminals, some of them are government agencies. Um, there are researchers that are constantly busy exploring the mathematics of cryptography and looking into what's going on. And there's even something called quantum computing that they say could change everything, but I'm not going to hold my breath on that one. They're a long way away from that. So we've got some hashing algorithms. Um, that's probably more information than you really want to need, need here. But what we would want a responsible site owner to do is to use encryption of a, a suitable type. So how this works in practice, your password is transmitted to the site in clear text. And that makes you vulnerable to what's called a man-in-the-middle attack. Now a man-in-the-middle attack is when I can somehow get between you and the website you're communicating with and read your messages as they go by. And there's various ways of doing that. Uh, one way to avoid that is to have a secure connection. Uh, HTTPS denotes a secure connection, whereas HTTP is not secure. Um, and we are starting to move towards making all web connections secure, but it's going to take a few years to make that transition. Um, so, then once the password gets to the site, what happens is the server 
takes your password, applies the hashing algorithm, and stores the hash. And that's what should be stored in the database. Um, and if they do that properly, then you're secure against a brute force attack. And a brute force attack is where they just take the password and set up a computer to just start trying all sorts of one thing after another until something clicks. Well, that's good, but the crooks came up with something called a dictionary attack. They said, oh, let's take all of the passwords we can think of and hash them ourselves and create a database of all of the hashes. And then what they can do is they can just do a lookup. All right, we got this hash in the database we downloaded from Target. Let's look it up in the database of hashes that we created and see if we get a match. If they do, they're in. <coughs> and our experience is that at least 50% of the passwords in a, in a database that's downloaded from a website can be found by this method pretty quickly. And part of the reason is what people do. Because a lot of people use passwords that we know are bad, like password. One, two, three, four. Or for the more security minded, one, two, three, four, five, six. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that last weekend. Let me in. Uh, and there's a thing called leet speak, and that's where you substitute numbers for letters. So instead of an O, you put in a zero and things like that. Um, they've got all of those in the dictionary as well. And in fact, many people will do it. So when you, if you download a, a dictionary, uh, you download a database from Target, and let's say it has 10 million passwords in it. It's not just one person in that database that used password as their password. It's probably a couple of thousand. You know, uh, and you're going to nab all of them at once. So, the next thing that a site can do is something called salted hash, and that's where they add a random number to the password before they do the hashing algorithm. And they use a different random number for each person, uh, and that's called the salt. Now, obviously that random number has to be stored in the same database as the hashed password, but it creates a huge problem for the crooks because <coughs> Generating that huge dictionary takes time. Um, and if they have to do that for each and every password that they find, um, it becomes a computational mess for them as well. So, salt is discoverable, but that's not really a problem. So, the state of the art right now is the salted hash. So, we started by looking at um, how websites are handling this and what the site owners ought to be doing. And now that you've seen that, I hope that's going to help you understand. We're going to talk about what you can do to be secure and what some recommendations are. All right. You want to create passwords that are less likely to fall to a dictionary attack. That's the objective here. <coughs> but what you learn today may not be state-of-the-art two or three years from now. I'm sorry, but that's really that's just the way it is. Uh, the, the crooks never sleep. <laughs> so you need to keep up with this. So, in security and in cryptography, we have a concept called entropy which is defined essentially the degree of randomness. So cryptographers talk about high entropy passwords. That means they're very, very random. So here's one right here. You know, that's pretty random. 
you know, it lo looks like my cat walked across the, the keyboard, right? Which is a, not a bad way to get something made. Whereas one, two, three, four, five, six is not random. Nor is the word password. So one way to think about random is it's less 